The 1918 influenza was incredibly deadly, killing 50 million people worldwide. Yet while young, healthy adults experienced exceptionally high mortality, the fatality rate in children and the elderly was not notably higher than what was experienced in regular influenza epidemics. Fatality rates were also relatively low in the first wave of the epidemic in the spring of 1918 and in the entire country of China. The variable that separates the times, locations, and age groups that experienced high versus low mortality is not the virus they were infected with, but rather how much aspirin they consumed. Aspirin was heavily advertised in August 1918 and officially recommended by the U.S. government for influenza in September. As doctors began dosing large amounts of aspirin, fatality rates suddenly began soaring. Everyone has their own threshold for aspirin poisoning, and the poisoning threshold may change with daily circumstances and disease. We know now that acidic urine prevents clearance of aspirin from the body, and illness can increase urine acidity, especially if fever is suppressed with medication. The doses of aspirin that were recommended in the United States were high enough to kill at least 3% of the population outright by directly causing pleural effusion into the lungs, a rapid and dangerous pneumonia, as well as internal bleeding and breathing difficulties. Aspirin also increases susceptibility to bacterial pneumonia. Many of the young adults who are dying in these ways are being treated with high doses of aspirin while older adults were more likely to reject the newfangled medicine, children's aspirin did not yet exist, and most citizens of China were treated only with traditional herbals. Today, in contrast, daily low-dose aspirin is embraced by both the elderly and the Chinese, and there's a suggestive parallel between the rates at which different populations use aspirin and the rate at which they are dying from COVID-19. What if COVID-19, in conjunction with other environmental factors and pharmaceuticals, increases urine acidity, decreasing the clearance of aspirin. Older populations who frequently take daily aspirin are dying at the highest rates, while children who are advised to never take aspirin while ill are experiencing mild illness. Even tiny babies do not seem to be at risk of fatality. Men who take more aspirin and ACE inhibitors than women are at higher risk. People with a history of heart disease who are most likely to be on aspirin therapy have nearly twice the risk of death from COVID-19 as people with chronic lung disease. In fact, doctors no longer recommend daily aspirin for most adults, based on recent research showing negative or null effects, and many people are currently taking it without being medically advised to do so. Doctors and patients need to work together to ensure that any unnecessary aspirin is not being used during the pandemic or by patients who are currently ill. In our companion video, we will discuss why other fever medications need to be avoided. The fever and immune system need to be able to do their job. Then I did something really weird. I went back in time to an epidemic of a viral illness that was a pandemic and at the time, they actually had an NSAID, and it was given quite liberally. And so the question is, what happened at that time, and what were the observations? And it actually was really quite interesting. And here's a paper that was published in 2009, Salicylate and Pandemic Influenza Mortality, 1918 to 1919, Pharmacology, Pathology, and Historic Evidence. And we'll put a link to this as well in the description below. And what it talks about is that aspirin had just come out in 1899 and it was a fresh drug to be used at the time and it was a great way to get rid of fever. And some people thought that if you could just treat the symptoms of the flu, the patient would get better. And one of the big symptoms of the flu, of course, was the fever. The paper goes into discussing what the toxic dosages are today based on what we know. At the time, people would be given large doses of aspirin until they saw toxicity, and then they would sort of pull back. They talk about four lines of evidence support the role of salicylate intoxication in 1918 influenza mortality, the pharmacokinetics, the mechanism of action, pathology, and official recommendations for toxic regimens of aspirin immediately before the October 1918 death spike. And for those who don't know, one grain equals 65 milligrams. So when we talk about grains, you'll see 
The aspen regimens recommended in 1918 are now known to regularly produce toxicities, and you can read about that here. We do know that salicylates cause immediate lung toxicity and may predispose to bacterial infection by increasing lung fluid and protein levels and impairing mucociliary clearance. And that the pathology of early deaths that we saw back in 1918 was consistent with aspirin toxicity and a virus-induced pathology. And remember, aspirin, which is a salicylate, is also an NSAID. So this kind of makes an interesting twist on the discussion about whether we should be using NSAIDs in COVID-19. And then, interestingly, it talks about the aspirin advertisements in August of 1918 and a series of official recommendations for aspirin in September, early October, preceded the death spike of October 1918. And it's interesting that the young adults coming back from World War I were more likely, they felt, to take aspirin, whereas the lower mortality in younger children may have been the result of less aspirin use. And interestingly, the major pediatric text of the time in 1918, and remember, they have no antibiotics, they have no antivirals, they have no ventilators. Essentially, what would happen in a major surge recommended not aspirin, not salicylate, but actually recommended hydrotherapy for fever. These were the great thinkers working with what they had at that time. And we can see at the time that there was a dichotomy that was set up in the treatment of the Spanish flu back in the 1918, 1919. Those that really believed in the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of aspirin and those that would treat with hydrotherapy. This is Dr. William A. Pearson in 1919. I'm quote, none are so blind as those who cannot see that the average mortality of influenza patients treated by homeopathic physicians was actually only about 1 30th, and that's a 30, not 13th, but 1 30th of the average mortality reported by all physicians. And then Dr. C. J. Loiseau from Des Moines in 1919 says, the German aspirin has killed more people than the German bullets have. I think... Uh, an epidemic, either naturally caused or intentionally caused, or intentionally caused, is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess deaths. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. Drop the base, Kitty. And if you want to protect your online privacy and help my channel out at the same time, visit drivenanddesire.com forward slash nordvpn if you sign up through that link i will earn a small commission to keep this channel as well as my other projects like drivenanddesire.com going take us out kitty i got money in the bank shot it with your thing shot it with your thing